So welcome to this video. I want to talk about what I'm calling the electron workstation. And by workstation, I'm referring to the massive workstation synthesizers that are generally very large and very expensive, and they can just kind of do everything. Uh, so what this is, is a, a more portable uh, kind of uh, component-based uh, setup that I think approximates a bit of what a workstation synth can do. So the idea here is that this is kind of your complete music making workstation, uh, your, your place where you can make um, full songs or at least the majority of the song. What I'm working with here as my Electron device is the model samples. Um, this is you know, at the cheapest end of what Electron makes, uh, but everything I'm talking about here also applies to the higher end Electron boxes. They all have basically the same sequencer and basically the same handling of MIDI and MIDI implementation. And so a lot of the stuff that you see here will also work on the more expensive options. Um, and of course, each of those options has other capabilities that the model samples doesn't have, right? Um, that said, I highly recommend if you're on a tight budget, starting with either the model samples or the model cycles, um, they will both work very well in this setup. And um, they're just, they're great. They're cheap and they're great. The main way that I have this set up right now is I'm using two different MIDI controllers to control uh, the Electron Box. So the first one in the chain here is this MPX-8. And I'm using this purely as a drum pad MIDI controller. Uh, so I've got MIDI coming out from this, going into the key step, ignore the key step for the moment. It's, uh, and then it's going out from there into the model samples. Um, now I will mention, I happen to have duplicates of almost all of these cables, so which is convenient, I can show them to you. So the model samples actually comes with um, this, uh, this gray adapter here. It comes with two of them, actually. These are type A adapters. And so if you buy it new, you don't have to buy these adapters separately, which is great. But if you do need to buy them separately, like say you bought it used and it didn't come with them or whatever, um, the, the, it's not a big deal. They're about $5 each. Uh, you just have to know which type to buy. And the answer is type A. You want to use type A. Um, what's great about the model samples is that even if you happen to have like a type B somewhere, like this white one, for example is type B, um, it actually auto senses the type that's coming in. So on your MIDI input, um, it actually doesn't matter which type you use. Either A or B will work. That said, if you're buying them, just buy type A. And then you're also going to need some you know, standard five pin MIDI cables. Um, and of course you can buy them in various lengths. I've actually found this one foot length to be really nice for having kind of a small tidy desktop setup like that. So I recommend the short length if you don't need the extra uh, distance out of that. So um, yeah, so for MIDI, basically I just have two of these cables, right? One is converting TRS to 5-pin and the other is converting 5-pin back to TRS. So um, a bit of a mismatch there, you know, a different MIDI controller instead of the key step might have TRS natively, in which case you wouldn't need these adapters and you'd have far less cable bulk, which would be really nice. So um, I will recommend some other MIDI adapters that I think would be great for this setup. Uh, or sorry, some other MIDI controllers that would be great for this setup uh, where you wouldn't need all these adapters and extra cables, which would be cool. Okay, so the MPX-8 is my drum pad MIDI controller, and it's very simply mapped out where uh, I have the six pads here. Ignore these two for a minute. So I have these six pads mapped out to the six drum tracks. Okay, so whatever I have on these, uh, these tracks, um, I can play from these pads. These are velocity sensitive, um, they're not aftertouch, but the reason I like this particular unit, the MPX-8, is as far as I've seen, this is the absolute cheapest way to get good quality um, velocity sensitive drum pads as a MIDI controller. Now this is actually its own instrument, it has audio uh, sample playing capabilities. I'm not using it as an instrument whatsoever, I'm using it purely as a MIDI controller. And I think I paid $65 for this. Um, so compared to everything else out there, it's just the cheapest I found. And this little form factor is nice too, right? It fits, fits nice on your table. So the key step uh, probably needs no introduction. This is the original key step 32, we're now calling it. And um, the, all the other key step versions have a different number of keys, so key step 37 or whatever, they have uh, different, different names in that sense. So this one I'm using um, right now, I'm using it on the auto channel, and I'll explain that in a bit. So, all right, so right now it's just a keyboard controller for whatever track I have selected. Right, so that's pretty easy. So by default, Electron and a lot of drum machines, actually not just Electron, they use uh, channel 10 as the auto channel. So if you go into the MIDI menu here, and I have my in channels, and I scroll over to auto, 
auto in channel 10, all right? And so right now I'm sending channel 10 out from the key step. One of the great things about the key step is it's very quick to change which MIDI channel you're on. So there's these numbers across here, one through 16. You just hold shift and press whatever number you want to send. So in this case, I'm sending 10. Auto channel means whatever channel is selected, that's the channel that will play. So that's super easy, right? Um, the MPX-8 also sends on MIDI channel 10, which is how I can have this mapped out to be everything. Okay, so um, the way that works for auto channels is that you're going to pick the bottom most notes on the keyboard, which um, the key step's a little weird because it starts on F. Most keyboards start on C, right? So imagine this is the lowest possible octave on a piano keyboard. All you're gonna do is you're going to assign um, the MIDI notes here to correspond to those keys. So the lowest C on a keyboard is going to be MIDI note zero. So I have this one on MIDI note zero. Then the next one is gonna be MIDI note one. That's MIDI note one. Two, three, four, five, like that. So zero through five are gonna correspond to your six tracks on the auto in channel, which is channel 10 by default. That is super, super useful because it means you can have a single MIDI channel that controls the entire model samples at once, um, which, is, which is often what you want. But there are cases where you might not want that, okay? And um, so by default, the model samples assigns a different MIDI channel to each of the six tracks. So it's track one is channel one, track two is channel two, and so on up to track six is channel six. I recommend leaving those defaults because they're just logical, they make sense, they're easy to remember, right? Um, so my in channels I leave on default uh, for the model samples. Now, um, with the key step, I can easily change which channel I'm sending on. So for example, if I send on MIDI channel one, now I'm controlling track one, even though track four is the one that's selected. All right, and then switch to two. Now I'm controlling track two, right? So you have these kind of two layers of control. And this is really helpful because oftentimes what I wanna do is I wanna use the keyboard for my synth sounds, and I wanna use the drum pads for my drum, or rhythmic sounds, right? Makes sense? So what I often do is I leave the key step on channel six. My convention is that I like track six to be the, uh, the synth sound, which is also the default in the default kit here. Okay, and then I have this to be all the tracks, including track six, right? Now, on the MPX-8, I have these two extra drum pads, right? I have eight drum pads for six tracks. You can map them out however you want. What I chose to do is I'd say, whichever is the selected track right now, so in this case, track four, I'm gonna change it to six because it'll sound better. So whichever is the selected track, it's going to play hard-coded MIDI notes, which happen to be whatever the root note is here. I think by default, it's C5, let me see. Track setup, yeah, okay. So by default, these pads play C5. That's the note that they play. You can change that here in the track setup if you want. But what I have this setup to do is to play octaves lower. So this one is playing C4, and this one's playing C3. So watch this right, stepping down three octaves. Now, that's just a decision that I made and it's been working well, so I've been sticking with it. But that's totally optional, right? I could have these set to be uh, intervals like fifths. I could have them set to go up in pitch, whatever you want. All it is is just two extra pads to do whatever you want with. But with this particular unit, the only thing they can send is uh, MIDI notes. They cannot send MIDI CCs. With a fancier MIDI controller, like the other ones I'll recommend, they could send MIDI CCs instead. So you could use them to control a parameter instead of a note, which might be even more useful, right? So just be aware there's options depending on the limitations of the MIDI controllers that you're using. Now, um, Let's say I didn't have this, all right? And let's say I wanted to do um, drums on my keyboard instead, right? I could do that. All I would do is I would sh put the key step on channel 10, which is the auto channel, right? And then I would take my octave all the way down to the bottom. Just keep hitting this until you're at the lowest possible octave. And now, whoops. I went too low, there we go. Again, keyboard starts on C, not on F. So with this particular keyboard, ignore those. But so now my C is track one, two, three, four, five, six. And again, these are sending MIDI notes zero, note one, note two, note three, note four, note five, right? So it's the same thing I did here, 
I'm just now mapping out to keys instead of drum pads. So if I wanted to do finger drumming on here, you can. Um, so just to point that out, if you only have a keyboard, you can still use it as your drum input if you want. Now, you're probably asking, why don't I just use the velocity sensitive pads that are on here? Okay, you hear that? <laughs> it just dropped two of my kick drums, even though I was hitting with what felt like to me the same velocity. So that's why. This, these other MIDI inputs are way more reliable. Um, they don't drop notes in the, in the way that these pads do. Basically, these pads are too stiff. It's really hard to get the, um, the velocity set correctly. Now, in the latest firmware, they do have kind of a fix for that. You go into pad config, and then you can set either a fixed velocity uh, for a pad, um, or you can also change your velocity depth. And so um, you can't just make it be max velocity all the time with fixed, um, or you can turn fix off, and you can set your depth. And now, if you're doing this, what I recommend, I've just found a depth somewhere in the range of like 60 to 70, tends to work pretty well. Um, but you do have to do this for every single track, which is annoying. Um, there's no way to do it for all of them at once that I've found. So now with these two. So what this means is I'm taking the entire range of the 128 velocity values that it could have, and I'm roughly halving it. So it means that all of the, the velocity values that are below whatever number I set here, like 64, it just won't play those. So my, my quietest I can possibly be is a velocity of 64, and my loudest is the max of 127. But you can hear it's just, I've lost a lot of the dynamic range of velocity there, um, and it's, it just doesn't feel that natural to, to play on these things. Like um, I think some people maybe like them, but I've just found that if you want that kind of finger drumming feeling, it just, it just doesn't work that well. Now, what these things do work well uh, for is pressure pads. Um, and it's not aftertouch, but you can kind of think of it somewhere along those lines. So let me turn my depth back up to max of 127. And now you see these lower two options here, destination and um, destination depth. So I will set something here. Let's do this. We'll set it on the synth track here. So I'm going to turn down my filter. So it's pretty obvious, all right? And now let's go into, uh, oops, the pad config, set my destination to be my filter, okay? And I want the depth to be, I'll do negative. So I want it to raise the filter to allow more frequencies through. So I went the wrong way in my depth. Um, by making it negative, I was making it drop the filter even more to the point where you couldn't hear anything. So let's go positive. I'm gonna make it open up the filter or increase the filter value, that's what I want. Scroll, 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 scroll. Boom. So you can hear it's playing with the filter value, but again, it's just, it doesn't work that well. Um, something else that you can do that's maybe a little more interesting, I think, instead of that, let's set it to, let's set it to pitch. Turn that up a bit. So basically what I'm now doing is that my velocity, however hard I hit this, is mapped to the pitch value. So it's kind of like I'm getting a random pitch value depending on how hard I hit this. So that's kind of an interesting use of these, right? So I would say using these, the velocity on these pads as a modulation source is interesting. Um, using it as your actual like velocity, uh, you know, in terms of finger drumming, it just is not great. And unfortunately, at the moment with current firmware, this option does not pass through to this, right? Oh, it does. It does pass through. Cool. So as I send velocity from this pad, it's also affecting that modulation. Right, so that's really cool actually. Um, so that gives you uh, just kind of another way of controlling your, um, your, your modulation, uh, which is pretty interesting, I think. 
So let's go ahead and turn that back off. Notice also, anytime you're setting a modulation destination on this, you just turn the knob you want and it jumps you to that. Right, so you can cycle through all of them like this. You see it's running across all of them. But you can also just jump to whatever parameter you want by just turning that knob. And that's, that's also a really cool little time saver thing. For now though, let's just turn it back to off. Okay. Okay. Back to our default synth sound, yeah. So the model samples in particular, and the model cycles as well, is monophonic per track. That means I can send it strings of one note at a time per track. And there's six of these tracks. So within a single track, you cannot play a chord in terms of the MIDI notes. Um, the model cycles has a chord mode that you can use. And on the model samples, you can play a sample of a chord, of course. So you can get chords. But in terms of like playing, you know, whatever three note, four note chord you're used to on the keyboard, it's not going to work. It's only going to send a single, well, it's going to send all three of the notes, but it's only going to respond to one of them. All right. But actually, the fact that it sends all of them is important. We'll get to that later. When you hook a polyphonic synth up downstream of this, you can still play it polyphonically, right? It's not filtering out those many notes. It's just that the model samples itself can only respond to one. Now, of course, uh, more expensive and fancier electron boxes can do full polyphony. Um, so that's a limitation of this kind of entry level uh, system here. So um, we're not quite to the point yet of needing this, but I want to point it out at this point, just in terms of talking about the cabling and the connections. So this is just your standard uh, headphone splitter, like a headphone Y splitter. TRS in and then two uh, TRS females here. And what's great about this is that this can be a super cheap uh, MIDI splitter. So I plug this into the MIDI out port on my model samples. And I now have two different MIDI output paths from the model samples. And I can use them in different ways. Um, I'm gonna hook up some other stuff later to really demonstrate this, but the idea is that I can send this out to two different uh, MIDI instruments, and I can use the model samples to sequence those instruments, and or I can also pass through my MIDI controllers through to them. Um, so we'll get into that a bit later, but um, this is one of the reasons why this setup is so versatile, I think, is because these MIDI splitters uh, as just a TRS Y splitter are so cheap and easy, right? Now, the other final kind of custom cable that you want for this, uh, this unfortunately does not ship with the model samples. You have to get it yourself. Um, this is just a USB to uh, the barrel plug on the back of here. Um, and this allows you to power it from any USB source, um, including a laptop um, uh, USB port, um, because it pulls very small amounts of power. So you can power it from a laptop if you want to. Um, you can also power it from a portable battery like I'm doing here, or from a wall adapter, whatever you want. Um, these cables cost, you know, three to eight dollars. They're very affordable. Um, and you might have them already if you just dig around in your box of cables. Um, they're, they're fairly common, actually. So it's definitely worth um, getting, getting one or two of these. So I'm powering everything off of batteries right now because I just really enjoy that. Specifically, I'm using these. Um, these are the Charmast. Uh, uh, 10, 400 uh, milliamp hours. They make bigger ones also. I just like how small and compact these are. And you can charge these with USB-C, um, which I love. So I can charge these from my phone and laptop charger. Um, I've chosen to split it out into two of them because I found that with some of the other instruments I'll introduce later, um, there can be ground loop issues. And by giving instruments their own dedicated battery, you eliminate all the ground loop issues. So that's just a convenience thing. If you want to use one big battery to power everything, you totally can. So um, let's talk a little bit about the, um, the key steps specifically as to why it's kind of an interesting choice, but also why there's also some, some good alternatives. So um, let's, for now, I'm going to just remove the MPX-8, get it out of the way. Let's focus on just this. So with the key step, um, you do have velocity sensitive keys, which are great. The model samples can respond to that. You also have aftertouch which the model samples does not respond to aftertouch in current firmware. Maybe in the future it will. Fancier electron boxes, uh, such as the Digitone, they do respond to aftertouch. So this is a kind of a good future-proof keyboard in that sense if you upgrade in the future. Um, now you've got your pitch bend. The model samples does not reply, uh, respond to pitch bend. Again, other uh, devices will. Mod wheel is a standard MIDI CC message. Um, and so it's kind of a generic message that says like, I am the mod wheel. Um, the model samples does not respond to mod wheel, at least not in current firmware. Fancier electron boxes do respond to mod wheel. Um, so again, that's something you're probably gonna find more use with on other boxes. Um, and 
what's great about the fancier boxes too is they will let you on the fly change what the mod wheel maps to right so i can for example have it mapped to filter cut off or delay send or whatever and i can change that on the fly not on the model samples or the model cycles but on fancier electron boxes it does do that so basically the key step in terms of the midi messages it can send is actually a little bit more capable than what the model samples is able to receive and respond to so the other weird thing with the key step is that it can be the master clock but uh, the clock only it only sends out clock over MIDI when either the sequencer or the ARP is running. All right? So now it's running. You see it did send the start stop message to this. So the model sample started playing and then likewise I can stop and play there. Right? So that's all good. Um, the problem is that if I look at my tempo here, so right now I'm on my default tempo of 120. Right? Now if I press play, it switches to external. So now it's listening to the external clock and this knob here changes my playback speed. So I can make it really fast, really slow. The problem is I have no real way of knowing what tempo the key step is on. And I think that's one of the primary um, benefits of the key step 37, the upgraded model. It has a screen and it tells you what tempo you're on. So if you had the key step 37, I'd say go ahead and make it the master clock. There's no downside there. With the key step 32, though, there is a downside because I just never know what tempo I'm on. And the model samples doesn't tell me. It just says, yeah, it's external. Um, so for me, that's kind of frustrating. So let's say. I wanted to use the key step, but I don't want to have this mess with, uh, you know, it only sending clock when it's playing. Okay. Um, so I can just go into the model samples, go into the MIDI menu, the sync menu, and I can say clock in, turn off. Okay. So that means that the model samples is completely ignoring whatever clock the key step is sending. So if I press play, nothing happens, right? It doesn't start playing. It doesn't stop playing. I can change this. Uh, here, like if I go in here, I play this sequencer, it's on 120. You see, I'm turning my tempo knob, nothing's happening. So the model samples is completely ignoring whatever uh, clock the key step is sending, but I can still send notes. <laughs> and because my ARP is playing, I can still use my ARP. And notice my ARP has a separate tempo now, which means that my arpeggiator does not need to be in sync with my model samples. That can be a good thing or it can be a bad thing depending on what your goals are. Um, I find it to be kind of fun actually to have my, my ARP be uh, separate and uh, just like a different, you know, a different interval that I can tweak on the fly, get that kind of ratcheting effect. Here, let's do it like on a drum maybe. Right, so you can get that kind of ratcheting effect if you want it, which is similar to the retrig functionality. Right. Uh, with retrig, you have to go in here and you can change your speeds kind of like this. Uh, you can set it to always on, so it just always does it. Okay. So this, uh, the model samples can do this kind of ARP retrig thing on its own. It doesn't need an external MIDI controller for that, but it's nice to have both options, right? Um, in fact, I could, I think, use both at once. <laughs> it's kind of awkward, but uh, you, you could figure out a way maybe to use both at once. Now, um, most likely the way I would do it is I would use retrig on here for my actual percussive elements, and I might use the art for my synth track, something like that. Um, and of course, you have your different art modes, time divisions, etc. Talk a little bit about some of the alternatives here. So instead of having two separate MIDI controllers like this, which I understand is a little ridiculous, um, you might want to have one MIDI controller that has both keys and pads and maybe a few other things too. Uh, so I think in terms of what's available today, I think probably the most compelling uh, small portable option is the M-Audio uh, Pro Mini part of their oxygen line. And uh, basically what's interesting about this one is that every single parameter on here, or sorry, every single control interface on here, the pads, um, the knobs, the faders, the keys, all this stuff can be mapped out separately. So everything can send on a different MIDI channel. It can send a different type of MIDI value, such as a CC or a MIDI note or whatever. And so it's extremely customizable in terms of like, if you want to make this into a custom controller for, you know, the model samples, plus maybe some other gear you have as well, you can totally do that. Um, so I've, I've looked into this pretty heavily. I've even like gone through the control uh, software where you would customize it and like everything looks great. So I don't own one, um, but it's, uh, it looks like a really, really compelling option for this. 
Other ones to mention, um, I already mentioned the key step 37. If you primarily want keys, you don't really care about drum pads, and you also want the four extra knobs that it gives you, you can map those knobs out to MIDI CC values. Um, that's, that's a good one. And again, it solves that tempo problem and has a few other options like the, the strum uh, arpeggiator type is pretty cool, I think. So key step 37 is a solid one if you just want the nice traditional keyboard interface. But I do want to mention though, having the four knobs to map out in my opinion, for the model samples specifically, is not that useful. The model samples is already pretty not one knob per function. There's very little that's buried under like a secondary shift menu. And so there's not that much to map out to this one. Um, the, now, probably you would want to map those, those four knobs out to some other downstream synth, and we'll get to that later. So I also mentioned the Novation launch pad. Like let's say you don't care about keys at all and you just want a big grid of pads, of drum pads. The Novation launch pad Pro Mark III is great for that. Um, now it itself is a full sequencer. It can do a heck of a lot of stuff, polyphonic sequencing. So it's, it's kind of overkill uh, for just the model samples. But if, again, you're trying to build out a bigger setup where you have a lot more stuff and polysynths as well and you just like pad interfaces, that one's definitely worth a look. The final one I mentioned is the uh, the Q Nexus, uh, and specifically I would go for the the, the new Q Nexus Red version. It um, it does a lot of cool stuff. It kind of combines the pads and the keys into one uh, interface, and um, so you can have both your drum pads and your you know kind of keyboard input all as one thing. Now definitely it's different. I haven't used one yet, um, but it's pretty intriguing in the sense that it's super small, super thin, um, extremely portable, obviously. Um, and it actually even has its own internal sequencer as well, so it's kind of similar to the key step in that sense. Um, and it can, uh, it can do some really cool stuff. Um, it does MPE output, which the model samples can't really accept like MPE, but I think there might be ways where you could map out certain MPE parameters to be certain parameters within the model samples or whatever electron box you're using. And certainly you could have some other synth that does do MPE natively and you could use it as the controller for that. Um, so definitely there's a, it's, it's definitely worth a look, the Q-Nexus. Um, it's the most expensive, I think, or, well, it's, it's more expensive than a lot of these options, but it's, um, it's pretty interesting. The da biggest downside, in my opinion, is this um, kind of awkward USB to 5-pin MIDI DIN adapter. It comes with it, thankfully, but it's just kind of a, it's a non-standard thing, um, and it's not going to be interchangeable with any other instruments you have. And so it's kind of annoying. Um, I also wish they had an option for their you know, MIDI USB to TRS because that would mean less adapters and less cable bulk for these instruments that use TRS directly, such as the model samples does here. So that to me is kind of a downside, um, but all in all, it's, uh, it's worth a look, especially if you're into kind of the ultra portable side of this. So um, the one thing though that again, I think makes the key step line pretty special is just how quick it is to change these MIDI channel outputs. On some of these other devices I mentioned, you can still do it, but you might have to go into a menu or something. Whereas like the, the model samples really is designed to kind of do it on the fly. Um, and so I will try to demonstrate that now with just a small little something that I'll make up. So um, I'm going to load, just to give us some different sounds, I'm gonna load one of the other drum kits that it comes with. Okay, let's um, let's just try to make something here. I know I'm gonna go for 32 steps, and just I'm gonna add something as a metronome. Not you. Okay, you'll work. So you're gonna be my metronome. It has a built-in metronome. I just prefer to use a real sound for this. Okay. And let's change that tempo.
you. Sixteenths on this. Okay, um, <laughs> kind of getting lost in this, but so the on my track four here, where I have um, this uh, this like crash cymbal sound on every single trig, um, a really uh, you notice I turned the decay way down so to make it kind of like uh, a little bit um, I don't know low decay, punchy, choppy, something. Um, a really fun little trick here. I'm going to bring in the um, the LFO, set it on my decay knob, and have that go way high um, and then turn the multiplier low and then let's do it on this stepped mode or the square wave so basically what that means it's like as if I'm created like a, a light switch a toggle switch where on certain steps it's just going to make the decay super long and then other ones it's going to make it short let's see how that sounds I think maybe I made, went the wrong direction here That's what I like. So let's listen just to the track four here, right? Right, so anyway, that kind of effect, I think is, it's really cool and it's really fun and easy to do on the model samples and a lot of the Electron devices. Um, and of course I could, so right now I'm doing it with an LFO, so it's doing it in kind of a rhythmic way. Um, and this LFO is synced to the BPM. I could also have the LFO be free running if I want it to be out of sync with the BPM. And I could also do it per trig. So I could just individually pick certain trigs to do it. Um, anyway, a bit of a tangent there, but one of the reasons why this thing is super fun. So, okay, so I've got like um, my kind of basic little drum pattern here going, right? This is often the way I do it. You can have your own conventions, but um, by default with the very first kit, when you very first turn this on, uh, that's laid out is track one is kick, uh, two is snare, three is uh, I think closed hi-hat, four is open hi-hat, five is a percussion sound, I think it's like a woodblock kind of sound, um, and then track six is a synth type of sound. Um, I actually generally like sticking with that convention, so it just makes sense. So, so my version of that is track one is always kick, track two is always snare, track three is always hi-hat. Now sometimes um, I separate out my hi-hats into two different tracks uh, where I have like open and closed, or sometimes I compress all my hi-hats into a single track to save space. Uh, so track three is hi-hat in one version or another. Um, and then starting at the other end, track six is always a synth, track five I always do as a synth as well, and then track four is my switch hitter. I can either make it be part of my synth group or part of my drum group if I want like an extra percussion sound or something. Um, and now since you can also do sample locking, which means that within a certain track I can add more stuff. So for example, I could have track one be both my kick and snare sound if I wanted to. I could compress those both into one track. Um, it makes it really easy to do that. The downside is that you lose that as a mute group. If I mute track one, I'm muting both my kick and my snare together. I can't separate them. So that's kind of, in terms of laying out your tracks, that's how you want to think about, like, what do I want to be able to mute individually? What do I want to be able to mute together? Um, so, for example, if there's something that you always want to hit with the kick and you're okay with muting them together, um, you know, you can compress them kind of into the same track like that if you want. Um, so just to mention that, it's kind of up to you how you have these laid out. I just find having your own conventions makes it easier, and it makes it easier to kind of memorize it um, when you're when you're messing around so okay so track five currently is another cymbal sound i'm going to change that to a synth sound because that's more what i'm into um let's just pick something oh i don't know fm choir sure <laughs> cool let's run with that 
So here's some FM choir sample. Um, and then this, what is, do I have on track six? Okay, that's the synth harp sound. Cool. So what I'm gonna do here is um, play these as two different uh, synth lines and we'll mess around with that. six sounds just kind of I don't know it's not really working for me it's too quiet let's find something else um, let's go back into you and find something weird synth tuned what's this sound like okay let's go with that so those are pretty similar all right so I'm gonna pitch this one up So notice on track six here, right, I changed my, my pitch. Um, so I made the default sound be higher than it otherwise would have been higher in pitch. Um, now, the way I have this mapped out, this pad plays whatever this sound is, regardless of what I do to it. So when I pitched it up, that also carried over to this pad, right? So this pad here, um, because my MPX-8 is sending on channel 10, the model samples is listening on channel 10 as the auto channel, right? Um, and I'm sending specifically MIDI note number five, and that is always going to be track number six. So when I change the pitch on this, it carried over, okay? Now, these two, I'm sending particular MIDI note values, and those MIDI note values are one octave and two octaves lower from whatever my pad is set to. But notice, when I changed my pitch, it does actually carry over, because I'm sending a MIDI note value, but the model samples is overriding and saying, well, okay, take whatever value that is and raise the pitch by whatever this amount is, or lower the pitch or whatever. So these are still octave relationships. So I think that's pretty cool. But I could also customize these. Like let's say in this one I wanted to say, I don't want this to be an octave anymore. Uh, let me go down, oops, wrong setting. So in here, I'm going to go down to my MIDI note value. And this, to me, this is kind of intuitive. I can just, I can just tune it with my jog wheel to be whatever I want. So now these two are the same. Let's make this like more like a fifth. All right, so you could set all of your pads to be, you know, whatever notes you want. You can do that on the fly. And you can even go through here, like I have another kit set on here. Uh, oops, let's go up to my kits, load kit number two. So I have kit number two set up where this is now a chromatic keyboard, just like the one down here. All right, that's chromatic. This is now chromatic also. So you really can customize however you want this to be. And I've, I found that for the most time for synth parts, you know, I like playing it on the keyboard, but for bass synth specifically, I don't know why, there's something about where I actually like playing it on a grid of pads, sometimes more than playing it on a keyboard. Um, and so you have that flexibility here, which I think is really cool. So, okay, anyway, let's get something down here. There's one note in there I would call a bad note. Um, so let's see, which one was that? Uh, 
This one here. So in this case, I can go in here, I can hold this note, let me back out of the screen. So I can hold this note and it's gonna tell me what it is, right? It's a D sharp three is what I entered from this pad. Um, and I would say, well, I don't really like that. Um, I can change it in multiple different ways, right? I can hold this note, I can turn the knob to just change whatever value it is, right? Easy enough. Um, I can also just enter a different note on my keyboard and it'll change it there or I can enter a different note on my chromatic pads down here, right? Whatever I want. In this case, let's try a, that's too high, let's try a D4, see how that sounds, okay. So I just wanna point out, it's really, really nice to be able to just hold a single trig, pick whatever note you want from whatever interface you want, and then let go and it's there, right? So in, as well as live playing in, you can also step by step just pick whatever you want, which is great. It's, it's, for me, at least, it's a lot more natural and intuitive to just pick it off a keyboard versus like scrolling through the note names, you know? So there we go. I might be clipping a bit here, sorry about that. So I've muted everything except for my, my little like drum and snare kind of pattern here, right? Um, but what's cool about this is that like these, these are still playing. Uh, so the mute function on the model samples is basically it's saying mute the internal sequencer. That's what it's doing. But it's not actually muting the track, right? So I can still play my synth sounds even though it's muted, right? So, So just to demonstrate, it kind of gives you this flexibility of like quickly switching between your sequence and also just live playing something on top of it. Now I'm going to switch to channel number five. So I'm controlling this one. Okay, now let me point that out too. Um, let's mute everything except for track number five. So I just have this weird sound, okay. So I'm going to play my sequence on track number five. We're only going to hear track number five because everything else is muted. So that's my sequence playing. But anytime I press a mini note, I'm gonna hear whatever note I've pressed. And then it's effectively a choke group, right? As long as I hold it down, this MIDI signal is overriding the internal sequence. So it allows you to create these kind of um, on the fly choke groups, basically, All right? As soon as I let go, it keeps playing the internal sequence. Okay, this one's set to that, so let's change this here. I can do the same thing here. Right, as long as I'm holding down this pad, I've effectively muted the internal sequence, and now I let go, and it keeps, it keeps playing wherever it was in its cycle. It's also cutting off the note, right? Notice these ones ring out a bit, right? So anyway, I find that to be really fun. So you can set this up like the way I often work, you know, I'm, I'm using this initially to kind of input my drum pattern in kind of a, a fluid way. And then later on, as I go on, I'm using this to actually control like mute groups, right? Well, here, I'll just try to demonstrate. Uh, so let's turn everything back on, play my whole pattern. 
Say I want to mute the kick temporarily. Keep holding that down. And I want to mute track four also. All right. So I'm holding both these down, so that's tracks one and four I have temporarily muted. All right. Mute. Mute. Okay. So I find that really intuitive. Like the kind of the downside is that you will hear whatever that sound is when you hit the pad, right? It's not the same as going function mute here. So yeah. That's a little, I think, a little taste of how the, the flexibility of routing your MIDI, like routing your MIDI on the fly, really, um, into the model samples. It's just going to let you achieve a lot of different kind of performance effects and performance environments, right? Um, another really useful thing, let's do it on, I'm sure, on this one. Uh, you can go into your retrig menu, turn always on, make that be like crazy fast, 180. Okay. And so now, Let's listen to just track three here. All right, so here's my track three pattern. All right, at any point I can hold that and get this like glitch effect, right? I cannot control that glitch effect from here, unfortunately, but I can do this, you know, my own thing. All right, so I can kind of go back and forth between the different input options that I have in terms of like my own finger drumming and using retrig. So in that sense, having these be kind of an extra layer of input on top of what I consider to be the better input options, um, it's nice. It's, it's certainly something that I, you know, I'd use from time to time. So. <laughs> anyway, you can get into some weird territory with that if you want to. So what do we have next?